Hey, warm welcome to all our campuses today. Really glad that you're there with us. If you're there in Pitt Meadows or in Strathcona, commercial, thank you for taking time out of your day to be with us. And if you're watching online, thank you, whether you be in Korea or whether you're in Brazil or whether you're there in Switzerland, wherever you are around the world, we're glad that you took time out of your day to join us as we go into Matthew chapter 7 today. We're talking about the Sermon on the Mount, and today we'll be talking a little bit about how we want to seek after God. And there's a great promise that seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. And as you've taken time today to seek him and put him first in your life, things will be added into your life. So you're in the right place today, and we're glad that you're with us and taking time to study and know God's word. We've been in the Sermon on the Mount now for a few weeks, and uh, if you weren't with us two weeks ago, we talked about the first part of Matthew chapter 7, where it talks about judging. And if you missed that, it's a good message to go back and uh, take a look at it again, because... It's a verse that's often misquoted. Oh, don't judge me. Well, God did say we to judge, but there's a right way and a wrong way to do it. And we talked about humility. We talked about being gentle and careful and loving and how to help one another and how to look at ourselves in the mirror and see what God's doing in our own life first. So if you missed that message, I, I hope you take time to go back and, uh, and get that message. The Sermon on the Mount is... Jesus transitioning us from the Old Testament into the New Testament. It's kingdom ethics from another world. The ministry of Jesus had been growing and flourishing for 30 years. He was in obscurity as this young man that grew up to be a carpenter. And then he launched his public ministry after his baptism. And as he began to go and to minister people, miracles were happening and people were drawn to him. So he went to the Sermon on the Mount and he began to teach them. And at the end of Matthew chapter 7, the end of the Sermon on the Mount, you can read that the people were astonished at his teachings. You know, the miracles, the signs, the wonders were pointing to Jesus. And I think, I'm thankful that Jesus still does miracles. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you know those miracles, they do the same thing today that they did back then. They point to Jesus, and they point to his sayings, because Jesus is the Word. He said, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Jesus is the Word. He said, my words are spirit. They're life. They're, they're different than the, you know, what you'd read in a newspaper or in a magazine. His words are spirit and life. It's no wonder when they heard the Sermon on the Mount, it was like, oh, this is just touching my spirit. There's something about the words of Jesus. So today we're going to look further into the Sermon on the Mount, and we're going to be in Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 to 12, and we've entitled it, Ask, Seek, and Knock. So if you have your Bibles, you can go to Matthew chapter 7, or if you have your notes, you can go there, follow along. Our notes are also on the church app. You can download that, and they'll be there. So let's go to Matthew chapter 7 and uh, read here where it says, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. And right away, you can say, oh, I recognize that. You know, the Sermon on the Mount has so many great classic passages, and we're going to break that down, ask, seek, and knock, in just a bit. Everyone, everyone, I'm glad it says everyone, because that means all of us. Everyone asks and receives. He who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who... If his son asks for bread, we'll give him a stone. Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? Question mark. If you then, being evil, know to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father, now really take note of this because we're talking about the father a lot, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. So let, let's break this down. Jesus is challenging us here in a couple areas. One, he's challenging us to grow in our prayer lives. And we take this ask, seek, and knock, which makes an acronym. Ask, seek, and knock. And really, these are, are three levels of your maturity, your prayer life. When we first come to Christ, we're really, as babes in Christ, we just say, God, I need you. And we ask God for 
lots of things. It was just the early stages, much like a baby when it comes into this world. It cries, says, oh, you know, I need my diaper changed. I need food, or whatever. There's just this need. I, I need you. This, this cry goes out to God. And uh, in John 16, 24, Jesus said, until now, you've asked nothing in my name, asking you'll receive that your joy may be full. And so much like a parent taking care of a baby, you want to make that child joyful, full of life, and so you, 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 you nurture it. And when we come to Christ, you know, maybe as a, when you first came to God, you just think, man, the prayers that I prayed, it seemed like so quickly God answered them, and he was right there for me, because you were a babe in Christ. And so that's the first level of prayer, where we ask God for our needs to be met. Then the second one is where we seek. Seek is, I'm not just interested in God answering my needs, answering these prayers. Actually, I want to get to know God. And, uh, you know, I think of my, my son when he was younger, you know, of course, when he was a little boy, I, I was there for him, change his diaper, feed him, help him, and, and be there for him. But then there was a day where I remember he, he, he would reach out and he would hold my hand. And, and he said, Daddy, would you come play with me? And he, and he just wanted to spend time with his father. And I like meeting his needs, never stop doing that. We never stop asking God for help. But as we mature in God, it's not just God, can you answer my prayer, I need you. Ah, I wanna be with my father. I wanna be with my daddy. It's like Paul says in Romans, we call him Abba Father or Papa. I wanna be with my daddy. And so we want to get past level one, just asking God for things, where we want to seek his presence. One of my verses, my favorite verses is Psalm 42, verse one, where it says, as a deer pants for the water, Brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. There's an interesting comment in the, in the Dakes Bible on this verse, where it says, as a deer pants for the water. The King James says, the deer has the word heart. The, the, it's a, a male deer you find in the Middle East. And th- he says, it's interesting. When you would go there and you'd f- look at this deer, there's something interesting about it. Because that deer panted for the water. It would feed along the water. And when it panted for the water, it was not just to get a drink. That deer, if it was being chased by the enemy, by a dog or somebody was... Uh, uh, tracking that deer, going to attack it, it would jump into the stream, into that brook, and it would get in the middle of the stream, and then it would submerge itself, and it would float down the middle of the stream, not touching any branches on either side, sometimes sticking its nose out, and it would float down the stream, submerged in the water, and then it would jump out. And when it jumped out, it lost the scent of the hounds that were after it. And in life, we have the enemy like a hound. He's after you. And when you, when you jump into the stream of God, when you jump into his presence and you, and you get lost in his presence, and when you come out of his presence, you know what? Your enemy says, where did he go? I, I thought I was on Dave's trail. I thought I had him. But he got submerged in God. And I, can't, I, can't, I can't pick up his sand. Where did he go? And if you, if you want to shake the devil off your case, just seek God's presence, jump into his presence. And when you come out of his presence, like, where did he go? You, you've lost, he, he can't find you anymore. You, you've hidden yourself in the secret place of the Most High. No evil will befall you, nor any plague come near your dwelling. Why? Because you've set your love upon him. Therefore, I will deliver him. Therefore, I will honor him. That, that's Psalm 91. So one is seek or ask, and then number two is seek. As we mature, we begin to seek. I wanna be with my father. I wanna be with him. So that's the second level of prayer. Our prayer life should grow, amen? We, we should go from glory to glory. And then third one is to knock. As we grow in our faith, we learn to knock on the doors of opportunity. Ask, God, I have needs. Seek. I want to be in your presence. I just don't want a need from you, Daddy. I want to be with you, Daddy. I want to be hang out with you. I want you to be in my life. And then thirdly, as you mature, I think again of my son. You know, there was a day, hey, Dad, I want to be with you. 
We used to go for breakfast, and, and uh, we'd have our regular routine, Saturday morning breakfast. And, but then one day, my, my son said to me, Dad, I know that we're getting ready, packing the things up for church. Can I help you do that? And what was happening was he was maturing. It was like, Dad, I want to be involved in what you're doing. I want to be, I want to build, quote unquote, your kingdom. And as we grow in God, we start with our needs. We want to spend time with our Father. And then comes the time like, God, I want to be part of that. I want to knock on the doors of opportunity. I want to step up and do really what it is in the spiritual realm. It's spiritual warfare. I want to step into there and push back the forces of darkness. Because there's a place in our, in our prayer life ask, seek, knock, where we also want to just, okay, now it's not just about me, it's about the kingdom. And there's forces of darkness that need to be pushed back. Look at Matthew chapter 11, verses 22 to 24. Here Jesus, or or Mark chapter 11, I should say. Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. Would Would you say that with me today in all our campuses? One, two, three, have faith in God. All right, have faith in God. For surely I say to you, whoever, so it means all of us, whether you're in Pitt Meadows or Commercial or Strathcona, if you're watching online, this is for you. Have faith in God. Whoever, it could be any one of us, whoever says to this mountain, they're going to, what are they going to do? They're going to knock over a mountain. They're going to make some pushing in the spiritual realm. That didn't happen in level one. Didn't happen in level two. But now as I'm growing in my prayer life, I want to make some difference in the spiritual kingdom. So whoever says to this mountain, be removed, cast into the sea. Of course, he wasn't talking about a physical mountain. This was spiritual mountains that need to be moved. Spiritual mountains in your loved one's life. A mountain of disbelief, a mountain of disease, or a mountain of poverty. I'm going to speak to those mountains Again, this is coming down to this greater level, maturing in our faith, faith in God. Be removed, cast in the sea, does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he what? Says. The way we move mountains is by the way we speak. He will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you'll have them. So the way we speak to our mountain, the way we knock it, push it, is related to our prayer life. Three levels of prayer. Ask, seek, and knock. Now, in this passage, Jesus is expecting us to grow in our prayer life and expects us to pray with perseverance. And a good example of this is Daniel. You know, Daniel, there was a a time when he was praying and uh, he just couldn't get a breakthrough. And uh, he, he was believing for an answer. And for 21 days, he was praying. And if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10, just turn over there. I don't have it on the screen for you, but if you have it in your Bibles, you can turn there or you can uh, uh, scroll over to Daniel chapter 10. Such a good verse. Need to point it out to you today, Daniel chapter 10. And he was praying. He hadn't gotten a breakthrough. And have you, have you ever been there where you're praying and praying just feels like, God, where are you? Are, are you even doing anything? Is, is anything happening? And you're maturing and you're standing, you're believing. And this is Daniel praying. In verse 12, it says, an angel comes and appears to him. Do not fear, Daniel, for the first day that you set your heart to understand, to humble yourself before God, your words were heard. Your words were heard. Whoever shall say to this mountain, your words were heard. And I've come because of of your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me for 21 days. Behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I've been left alone there with the king of Persia. So for 21 days. See, this is maturing. Now he's, he's, there's, ask God, I have needs. God's there for you. Seek, I want to be in your presence. I want to hide myself with God. But now also as we mature, there's this speak to the mountain like, like Daniel did. And after 21 days, the angel reminds, hey, your words were heard from the very first time. What was happening, there was a mountain moving. And now comes your breakthrough. 
And as you're, as you're moving your mountain and speaking to it, sometimes it takes a while, but we want to have perseverance. And he encouraged us to persevere in this prayer. Pray with perseverance. Uh, the verbs ask, seek, and knock are in the continuous presence tense, indicating it's something we do constantly. It's not a one-time thing. Prayer is a force. And when, when you're moving things, you have to just keep your faith pressure on it. Never forget, faith puts pressure on the powers of darkness. There's a spiritual pressure. And you just say, I'm just gonna keep the pressure up because this mountain will move. Unbelief will go. Poverty will go. Lack will go. Whatever that mountain is, you keep that faith pressure against it. That's why we read in Ephesians 6, 18, praying always, praying always with all perseverance, perseverance, supplication for all the saints. Remember Matthew 6, Jesus had said, and when you pray, not if you pray, when you pray. Now the translation says pray without ceasing in Thessalonians. It doesn't say read without ceasing. It doesn't say watch TV without ceasing. It doesn't say exercise without ceasing. It says pray without ceasing. There's such a power in our prayers. And here again, Jesus is encouraging us to pray that way. And then this also teaches us to pray with confidence in our Heavenly Father. Because he compares, he said, if you being evil, basically he says you're an evil bunch, you've you, you got a lot of work to be done in your life, and uh, he says if you, with all your flaws, with all your imperfection, can give good gifts to your children, if they ask you for bread, you don't give them a stone, you give them a piece of bread. He says if you can do that, how much more will the Father give you good things? Not bad things, but good things. Why? Because he's a good father. Got to hear a good amen. 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 All right. One more time, in Pitt Meadows. Can I hear a good amen in Pitt Meadows? A good amen in Strathcona. A good amen in commercial. There you go. And uh, if you're online, just say amen. Now, if you're sitting there on the sky train, and it might weird out the person beside you, but <laughs> just, just say amen. Yeah, because he's a good dad. It's so important that we have confidence in our Heavenly Father. If you don't have confidence, it's very hard to approach him. That's what the Bible says to come boldly before his throne of grace to receive help in a time of need. So we have to have this picture again of a great father, a heavenly father, and then we can pray with confidence to him. Matthew 7, 11, if you then being evil, Matthew, that's, that's your 7, 11 verse. There you go, right? <laughs> You know, the corner store, 7-Eleven, you know, <laughs> if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more, underline that in your notes, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what? Good things to those who ask him. Pray with confidence. Jesus wants us to pray that way. Ah, that's good. Perseverance. I'm, aren't you glad you got God on your side? Man, I, I'm so glad that he's, he never leaves us. He never, he never forsakes us. Daniel had incredible weight upon him. And, he, and he, he, not the first time he had incredible weight and pressure on him. There's another time in Daniel's life, in Daniel chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, turn over there. There's a time in Daniel's life where there was this dream that nobody could interpret. And so the king had said, look, if you guys don't interpret it, you're all dead. No pressure, right? Like either you, you, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you what the dream is. You have to tell me what the dream is and the interpretation. Uh, that, that's, and uh, so there's a lot of pressure. And Daniel, in Daniel chapter 2, verses 16, 17, 18, there it says, So Daniel went and asked the king to give him the, the, the time that he might tell the king the interpretation. Daniel went to his house, made the decision known to Hananiah, Michelle, Azariah, his companions, his life group. It's good to have a life group. We went and talked to his life group. Hey, you guys, we got a problem. If we don't get this dream, interpret it, we're all dead. And they said they would seek the mercies from God of heaven concerning the secret so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. It wasn't just for them, it was for the others. And I, I want to bring back to your remembrance because uh, last year we talked about this. It's a good time to put it in there. There's a, there's a formula in physics that says pressure 
is equal to force divided by area. And there's a, there was a lot of force coming down on, on Daniel. And so he's going to go into prayer. And if you, if you try to handle all the, the weight that comes on you in life, do you remember Jesus said, my, my yoke is easy, my what is light? My burden is light, my, my weight is light. And when, when Jesus comes along and helps you, he relieves the, the weight that's on you. And force is, is pounds, weight. You, you're familiar with, with PSI, pound per square inch. When you feel your car tire, your bicycle tire, pounds per square inch. So if this is one square inch, that's the area, and let's say I put, I had a table, one square inch, I put a thousand pounds on that square inch, that's the force, and that's the area. How many know it's gonna break? Because there's too much pressure, right? But what if I took that thousand pounds and I put it over, let's say this is a thousand square inches now. So now, instead of being a thousand pounds per one square inch, now I got a thousand pounds per thousand square inches. So this pressure goes way down, right? And what Daniel did here, when he prayed, when he was, had this, this incredible thing come against him, is he increased the area factor. He couldn't change this, but he could change the area. And in your life, you can't change the, this force that's coming against you, but I'm gonna preach myself happy today. But I can change the area. And you know, a secret of Daniel, he went and told his life group, Hananiah, Michelle, the rest of uh, Michelle, Azariah, he went and told them, he said, you guys, you gotta pray. Because there's this incredible weight coming down us. And it went from him to the God factor, the A changed, and as a result of it, the pressure lifted. And he could just be who he was. Now that's available for all of us. Jesus is saying here, the Father is with you. Man, if daddy's here, it doesn't matter what the this force factor is because I got my dad here. I don't want to do this on my own because I'll be, it'll wreck me. It'll, I'll be snowed under, so to speak, but with God. That's why it says, with God, all things are possible. Yeah. So, lastly, the way we understand the Father coming to Him, growing, maturing in Him, it really changes the way we treat other people. Because in Matthew 7, 12, Jesus said this, Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. Now this is, of course, what? The golden rule. Where did we get the idea of the golden rule from? Apparently, there was an emperor in the Roman Empire named Alexander Severus, and he, around 222 AD, he had that in his palace in gold letters. And so it became known as the golden rule. And you can find uh, variations of that in different places. Somebody once said, well, you know, Jesus wasn't the first person to come up with it. You can find it in other writings. You can't exactly find it in other writings. Because years ago, even before Christ, there was Confucius who said, do not unto others what you would not wish them done to yourself. Out of the Buddhist religion, we find putting oneself in the place of others, kill not, nor cause to kill. In the Apocrypha, Talbot wrote, do not do to anyone else what you yourself hate. A rabbi by the name of Hillel wrote, what is hateful to you, do not do to anyone else. But there's a subtle difference between what they said and what Jesus said. They said, do not, do not, do not. But Jesus comes along and says, do. You know what the difference is? You take the initiative. Do not do what somebody did to you. But Jesus said, no, no, it starts with you. You do first. And this is again what sets Jesus apart from others because he comes along and he empowers us by the Holy Spirit to take the first step. You do 
Why can we do that? Because greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. I have in your notes, so you can follow along, the golden rule is anchored in our relationship with God the Father, and our ancient actions are not determined by how people treat us, but how we desire them to treat us, and by how graciously the Father gives to us. Jesus did not say, do not do to others what you don't want done to you. Rather, Jesus is talking about us taking the first step, do, not just refrain from doing. Restraint is good, but initiation goes further. First of all, you guys take the first step. How can we take the first step? The reason that we can take the first step is because the way God the Father has treated us. So this isn't about me. Oh, you did this to me, so I'm going to treat you back the same way. No, no. This is, I am going to do to you. I'm going to initiate it to me, to you. Why? Because the Father already initiated it to me. I'm not doing it out of a vacuum. I'm doing it out of this love of God that's been poured into me. I'm not reciprocating your actions. I'm taking what's flowed from God the Father to me, and I'm taking the first step I'm doing to you what I would like others to do to me. Wow. No wonder it's called the golden rule. It's, this is the capstone of the Sermon on the Mount. This is kind of like Mount Everest in the Sermon on the Mount. This classic commandment he said, you know what, you wanna know how you should treat other people? Just stop and listen to yourself. What, what is yourself saying? How would you want to be treated in that situation? That's your cue. That's how you reach out and treat other people. And remember, if you're not sure how that is, your father treated you with grace, your father treated you with mercy, your father treated you with kindness. That's your cue. Now you can love others because his love was deposited into you. Wow. Well, the only way we can do this is through the help of the Holy Spirit. Can't do it on your own. You need the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 14, 15 and 16, I love what Jesus said. This is an encouragement to all of us. If you love me, keep my commandments. Of course, the greatest commandment is to love God and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. If you love me, keep my commandments. And connecting it to that statement is this. I will pray to the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. Do you know where we need help? Is the living that commandment out, loving other people. Because every day we're challenged on it. Every day there's a test to love other people the way we want to be loved. And I'm so glad that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit has come along and helped us. There, you know, speaking of physics, there's another law in physics. Uh, I love the way some of those natural laws have a parallel spiritual law. And, and there's another law that says if you have motion and you're going this way, the, the faster the motion, the more friction that there is. Right? You know, if, you, if your car, for example, the more RPMs you are, have, the hotter the motor will get. The, the faster you, you slide your hand across the table, the hotter it gets. There's more friction, right? And you know, the more you go after God, the more motion, the more you pursue God, the more friction you're going to encounter. If you just uh, pursue God a little bit, there won't be a lot of friction in your life. But you pursue God a lot, and you might find some friction in your office. If you pursue God a lot, your flesh will give you some friction. Eh, No, you don't have to get up every morning to pray. You don't have to go to prayer this Sunday morning earlier or this Saturday morning, or you don't have to, you'll, you'll find some friction. So what's the key to overcoming friction? Oil. That's what we put into our car motors. In the, in the Bible, the Holy Spirit is a symbol of oil. That's why in Romans 8, 13, it says, by the Spirit, I put to death the deeds of the flesh. By the Spirit, I overcome the friction in my flesh when I want to pursue God. You know, to live out these commandments, loving God, loving others, and you pursue that, you go after that, there's going to be some friction in your life. But I got good news for you today. Jesus said, I'll send you a helper. You know, what would it be like if you ordered a brand new car, 
but nobody put any oil in the motor. It wouldn't take long and you'd burn out the oil, burn out the motor. And Jesus said, I'm, I'm giving you power, but there's oil, there's a power of the Spirit in there that you can continue to move forward without burning out. You can pursue God with all your might. I'm going to invite our campus pastors to come on up, and they're going to share a couple thoughts with you and then close in prayer with you today. And if you're watching online, I wanted to share a couple thoughts with you as well. You can have the Holy Spirit living in your life. And the way the Spirit comes into our heart, we're a spiritual being. And the way His Spirit comes into our spirit is when we invite Him. The Bible says that He puts a new heart in us. He takes out a heart of stone and puts a living heart of flesh in. And then He puts His Spirit in there. He, his spirit and our spirit become one. And the way we do that is by inviting them into our life. We don't earn this privilege of being right with God. That was done by Christ. The Sermon on the Mount tells us how to live, but it doesn't make us right with God. We're been made right with God through what Christ did for us. And today, you can invite Jesus to come into your life. With that comes his spirit. He'll, the helper is sent. Helper sent to your address, to your heart. The helper lives within you. So I want to give you an opportunity today. Pray with me. If you're watching online, this would be the most important prayer you've ever prayed. It's a, it's a prayer of faith for sure. But you are a spiritual being and you are designed to live on love, to live with his life, to live in truth, to have his Holy Spirit help you. And he's, he's ready today to give you help to do that, to wash away your sins, make you a new person on the inside, write your name in the Lamb's book of life, a, a book of all eternity that you are right with God through what Christ did. So would you join me in prayer and just pray by faith with me today. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, this day I open my heart to you. I invite you into my life. I receive forgiveness. I receive a new life. I welcome you, Holy Spirit, to be my helper, to live for God. I receive you today, Jesus. Amen.